Okay, so now let's do a meditation. We've been going through the, um, the method for developing bodhicitta, which involves equalizing and exchanging self for others. And so each week we've done a different meditation involved with that. And so today I thought we could do a meditation on um, the point about actually deciding to change oneself for others, which means deciding to change our attitude so that instead of being self-centered, we cherish others more than ourselves. So we need to make that decision and then work on bringing about that transformation in our mind. <clears throat> so let's first briefly review the previous points that we reflected on in past weeks. The first is the equal the equality of self and others, which basically means understanding that all living beings, all sentient beings are basically the same in that we all wish for happiness, good experiences, and nobody wants pain or problems or any negative experience. So in that way, we are all the same, all living beings, no matter whether they're human or non-human, whether you know, from this country or that country, old or young, male or female, whatever kind of being there is, in our mind, we all have this wish to be happy, to have good experiences, and to not experience any suffering or problems. So just contemplate that, bring that awareness up into your mind. <clears throat> And so even though this is the case that everyone is equally wanting happiness and no suffering, our attitude usually is to feel more concerned for ourselves than for others. My happiness is more important than the happiness of others. My wish to be free of suffering is more important than that of others. But this is what's called a self-centered or selfish attitude. And um, the teachings say that this is actually counterproductive. This kind of attitude, even though you know we want to be happy, but this kind of attitude doesn't bring real happiness. Instead, it brings all kinds of sufferings, such as uh, when we, out of self-centeredness, act in harmful ways. We create negative karma, killing, stealing, and so forth. And we're creating the cause for suffering for ourselves. So just contemplate how this attitude of self-centeredness actually doesn't bring the happiness we want, but instead brings problems, unhappiness, unsatisfactoriness. Self-centeredness is also a major obstacle to spiritual practice, especially the bodhisattva's path. It's impossible to make progress on this path and reach the goal, enlightenment, Buddhahood, as long as we 
cherish ourselves and consider ourselves more important than others. So if we aspire to follow the Bodhisattva's path, become a Bodhisattva and then become a Buddha and benefit all beings, we must overcome this attitude. And then the opposite attitude of cherishing others, or it could also be called altruism, being concerned for others, and even reaching the point where we're more concerned for others than for oneself. This kind of attitude is the cause of happiness and good experiences. It's what motivates positive actions like uh, the 10 virtuous actions, avoiding the 10 non-virtues, practicing the 10 virtues. It's what motivates the practice of the six perfections, like giving, ethics, patience, and so on. And just in the world, it's, it's what motivates people to go out and help those who are in need, those who are hungry, those who are suffering from uh, natural disasters or homelessness or suffering from war and conflicts and so on. So it's what leads to happiness and peace and good experiences for ourselves as well as for others. So that attitude is much better, um, much more productive and the cause of happiness compared to the self-centered attitude. And also to follow the spiritual path, the bodhisattva's path, and attain the goal, enlightenment, Buddhahood. We can't do that. We can't do that. We can't achieve that without making this change in our mind, learning to be less self-centered, learning to be more centered on others, more concerned for others. So if that makes sense to you, see if you can generate the resolve, the determination to work on this. It's not going to happen by itself. We do have to make the effort seeing the benefit of making this change in our mind. So, so if you can generate the wish, the determination to bring about this change in your mind, decrease selfishness, and increase altruism, cherishing of others. Now it's possible that there will be some internal resistance to making this kind of change. For example, one thought that might come up in our mind would be, I have been so selfish all my life. I'm such a selfish person. There's no way I can change that. So it's true that Selfishness is a quality we all have, and we've probably had it all our life and also in past lives. So it's very strong, very predominant in our mind. And it's not easy to stop being selfish, but it's not impossible. So we can remind ourselves that the nature of our mind is impermanent. It's not permanent, not frozen, static, unchanging. 
but it's impermanent changing all the time that's its very nature and selfishness and other disturbing thoughts and emotions are not permanent fixed parts of the mind they too are impermanent they come and go similar to the way clouds come and go in the sky and so it is possible to change our mind if we apply effort as shanti deva says there is nothing that doesn't get easier through familiarity so by familiarizing ourselves with altruism cherishing others and defamiliarizing ourselves with self-centeredness we can slowly gradually change our mind Another objection that our, might, our mind might come up with is, why should I help others? Their suffering doesn't harm me and their happiness doesn't benefit me. So ask yourself, can you really be happy when someone else is in pain? Doesn't someone else's pain and suffering disturb your own mind, your own happiness? And haven't you felt happiness over somebody else's happiness? So when a friend, a loved one, a family member is happy, is experiencing something positive, something good in their life, doesn't that bring joy to you? So as the Dalai Lama says, we human beings are social animals. We don't do very well all by ourselves in isolation from others. So we need others to find meaning and joy in life. So is it really reasonable to think that others' well-being doesn't affect us? Another objection that might come up in our mind is that if I do cherish others, then what will happen to me? Who will take care of me? So cherishing others doesn't mean we have to neglect ourselves. We continue taking care of ourselves but we do it with a new outlook. For example, when we're eating food, instead of thinking only of our own pleasure, our enjoyment, we can think, I'm eating this food in order to have energy to continue practicing the Dharma and helping others and working for enlightenment so that I can help others in the best possible way. 
So we can still take care of ourselves, but with an attitude of dedicating ourselves to the benefit of others. So in a similar way, we can transform all the actions that we do, uh, studying, working, playing, sleeping, going to the doctor, taking care of our medical needs and so on. So we can do all of these things with an altruistic attitude of caring for ourselves, taking care of our needs so that we can practice the Dharma, benefit others now, and work for enlightenment to be able to benefit others in the best way. And also if we live our life with altruism, genuinely caring for others and cherishing others, then others will value us. They will love us. They will feel, oh, this person is really precious. And then anytime we are in need, there will be people there to help us, to take care of us. So see if you can conclude this meditation by feeling strong determination to work on bringing about this change in your mind and your attitude and your way of living to be less self-centered and more altruistic, more caring for others to the best of your ability. Okay, so we are uh, going through the text on the 70 topics, which in turn uh, covers the most important points of the text, uh, the Abhisamaya Lamkara by Maitreya, or the Ornament of Clear, uh, clear Realization, which, um, give, which explains the Bodhisattva's path. What, what a bodhisattva needs to do. It's much more detailed than what we find in the Lam Rim. Um, much more details about what a bodhisattva needs to do to reach enlightenment. And so the ornament has eight chapters, each one covering a different uh, clear realization that needs to be developed by a bodhisattva, somebody who wants to reach enlightenment. So up to now, we've finished the first four chapters, and tonight we will start looking at chapter five. So again, we're just looking at some of the main points. We don't have time to go through every single point, but just some of the main points in each of these chapters. So the, the subject matter of chapter five is called um, peak application. And um, this is the fifth of the clear realizations. A clear realization is a mental state, a highly developed mental state in the mind of a bodhisattva. And um, so in the ornament, the first three chapters talk about um, what are called the three exalted knowers. 
The first one is the exalted knower of all aspects, which is another way of saying enlightenment, enlightened mind. So that's the topic of the first chapter. And the second chapter is about the knower of bases, which are realizations in the mind of a bodhisattva, who's not yet enlightened, but working for enlightenment. Then the third is third chapter is, is knower of bases, um, which are realizations that could be in the mind of a bodhisattva, but they could also be in um, other practitioners like hearers and solitary realizers. Um, because it's said that a, a bodhisattva needs to cultivate the same realizations as hearers and solitary realizers, because a bodhisattva's goal is to become enlightened and then be able to help all other beings who want to follow a spiritual path, not necessarily the bodhisattva's path, but there are also beings who want to follow the hearer's path, which is a path for the attainment of nirvana, and also the solitary realizer's path. This is also for the attainment of nirvana. So there are beings who have an inclination to follow one of those paths, and a bodhisattva needs to be able to help them, so they have to know those paths. And so that's the, the idea behind the knower of bases, a bodhisattva developing the same uh, realizations as someone who follows the hearer's path and the solitary realizer's path so that they can guide people on those paths. So that's, that's just a brief summary of those first three clear realizations, which are called the three exalted knowers. And then the next four chapters, chapter four, five, six, and seven, are um, dealing with four applications. And an application is a practice. It's, it's kind of a technical term, but it just means a, a bodhisattva's practice. And so um, the last chapter we looked at, chapter four, is about the first of the four kinds of applications, which is called application in complete aspects. And in that chapter, um, we look at the 173 aspects. <laughs> There's 173 different objects that a bodhisattva meditates on. They have to learn these and, and reflect on them, meditate on them, and gain realizations of them. So we looked at just a few of the 173 aspects, so you get an idea of them. They include like the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths, which you may be familiar with, uh, the Four Close Placements of Mindfulness, the Six Perfections. So they include a lot of things that we know about, but we didn't have time to go through every single one of them. But anyway, um, so the application and complete aspects it basically involves um, learning these 173 aspects and then developing the ability to um, hold all of them in mind, yeah? To be able to have all of those 173 aspects in one's mind at the same time. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember, we talked about that. Yeah, so that, yeah, so the application and complete aspects is explained as um, cultivating the 173 aspects in a collective way, like all together in one mind, um, having them all under one's observation. And I mentioned last time that an analogy to this might be, let's say you're a teacher, you're a lecturer, or a professor in university, and you have 173 students uh, in your class. <laughs> so and you, you could be all together in, in a big lecture room, all those 173 students, and you're giving them a lecture. And so you can observe all of them together at the same time. So that, you know, just gives us a rough idea of, of what it means to have 173 obs obs objects in the mind at the same time. And so the, the, the previous application, application and complete aspects in the fourth chapter, it involves collect, you know, cultivating all of these in a collective way, gathering them all together. And it said that the purpose of doing that 
is to gain control over the 173 aspects. And the meaning of gaining control over the 173 aspects is being able to um, meditate on all of them at the same time in the right order, not all mixed up <laughs> in the right order and not leaving any out. So they need to be complete in a single session of meditation. So that's what a bodhisattva is training to do. Um, to gain control over the 173 aspects. And when they do that, when they do achieve that ability to gain control over all the 173 aspects, then that is the meaning of this one, peak application. So peak application is, is when, you, when the Bodhisattva has gained this control over the 173 aspects. So the definition, just look at the definition. Um, it's a bodhisattva's yoga. And again, bodhisattva's yoga just means a bodhisattva's practice that is based either on just calm abiding itself. Bodhisattvas do have calm abiding. Or at a higher level, a combination, a union of calm abiding and special insight. So that's what's involved in a yoga. So this is a bodhisattva's yoga, and it's conjoined with a wisdom highly transformed from the Mahayana path of accumulation that collectively cultivates the aspects of the three exalted knowers. So that's the definition from the text. And <laughs> don't worry if you don't understand it, we'll try to clarify the meaning of it. And so it's a, it's a, it's a mind, Bodhisattva's mind, Bodhisattva's realization. And it's conjoined, the meaning of conjoined is supported, accompanied, assisted. Um, so that is often the case that there can be two minds, two different states of mind, two different realizations that assist each other. For example, the wisdom of emptiness and great compassion or bodhicitta, these two minds assist each other. They help each other. The bodhicitta uh, increases one's uh, determination to cultivate wisdom and gain that wisdom. And then wisdom in turn um, assists great compassion and bodhicitta because you, you want so much to help other beings um, be free of suffering. And, you know, the way to do that is to help them realize emptiness. So those two minds, that, that's just a brief explanation, but those two minds assist each other. And so that's often the case that different aspects of a bodhisattva's mind, different realization that they have kind of assist each other. And that's the meaning of that term conjoined. Um, so it's a bodhisattva's yoga conjoined with a wisdom that's highly transformed from the Mahayana path of accumulation. So the Mahayana path of accumulation is the first of the five paths. That's when, like, when, when you first become a bodhisattva, when you gain um, uncontrived, spontaneous bodhicitta, that's the point where you become a bodhisattva. And that's when you enter the Mahayana path of accumulation. That's the first of the five paths. And um, so the previous application, application in complete aspects starts, starts from the Mahayana path of accumulation. So right from the beginning of being a bodhisattva and being on the path of accumulation, a bodhisattva is cultivating these 173 aspects in their mind in a collective way and um, highly transformed means that while the bodhisattvas on the path of accumulation, they're cultivating, they're developing this ability to meditate on the 173 aspects. And they do that for a long period of time and they get really good at it. And so then, um, and then eventually they attain this one, this peak application. This one begins on the path of preparation. So it's the second 
of the five paths. So having spent all that time on the path of accumulation, cultivating the 173 aspects, the Bodhisattva finally gains the ability to have them all in the mind at the same time, have control over them. And um, that's when they attain this peak application on the path of preparation. So the meaning of the wisdom highly transformed is, you know, your wisdom has increased greatly through practicing this on the Mahayana path of accumulation. And, and in fact, peak application is application in complete aspects. It's, you know, while you're on the path of accumulation, it's called um, the application in complete aspects. But then when you reach the second path, the path of preparation, it actually turns into peak application. Um, so it's, it's become a much more mature, a much more highly developed uh, practice um, on the path of accumulation. So, uh, sorry, the path of preparation. So it's a bit like, a, you know, a child and an adult, uh, a child at a certain point in their life, you know, they're, they're small and they're not very developed and their knowledge isn't very developed and so on. But then that child eventually becomes an adult and then they are much more developed physically and mentally. So it's the same person but at a different stage in their life. And so in a similar way, the, the application in complete aspects is on the path of accumulation. That's like the child. And then when you reach the path of preparation, it turns into this peak application. So it's basically the same kind of practice, the same state of mind, but at a higher level. Does that make sense? So it's, that's why it's called highly transformed. And so, yeah, so when you reach this point, when you have peak application, this is like the adult stage, then you have this ability to hold in your mind all these 173 aspects, <laughs> um, it, you know, in a complete way, not leaving any of them out. And do you remember um, what's the starting point of the path of preparation? How does that begin? How does one enter the path of preparation? Union of calm abiding and special insight. Right. Well, it's the union of calm abiding and special insight focused on emptiness, the ob with the object of emptiness. So, so when a bodhisattva, bodhisattva be, even before the path of accumulation, they've already developed calm abiding. That's a prerequisite to, to enter the path of accumulation. And then on the path of accumulation, the first path, they're developing their wisdom and then gradually combining the calm abiding and their wisdom, realizing emptiness. And when they're able to gain that union of calm abiding and special insight, when that occurs, then that's the beginning of the path of preparation. So that means the bodhisattva, when they reach the path of preparation, their mind is very well developed. They have super strong concentration, of course. Um, and they also have very, very strong um, meditation on emptiness and, and this ability to combine those two, calm abiding and special insight. And so then thinking about that, you can imagine that the bodhisattva's mind, whatever they're focusing on, anything that they focus on, it's gonna be much more powerful, their concentration and their understanding. And so that's the point at which the, this particular uh, application begins. Um, so um, once we get through all the four applications in chapter four, five, six, and seven, I'll put together a kind of summary and a comparison of them. Now we're just going through them one by one, but later we'll, we'll look at a comparison of them to see how they are the same and how they differ. 
Um, and we might find it difficult to fathom how a person can actually uh, meditate on 173 things at the same time. And these are complicated things. They're not like, you know, simple things. <laughs> They're complex. Each of these 173 aspects itself is quite complex. So, you know, we have a hard time keeping just a few things in the mind at the same time. Um, but just today at lunch, uh, some of us were having a discussion about a local um, um, pet rescue place. Uh, this woman um, rescues cats in particular, and uh, she has 60 cats. So Venerable Semke, you know, went, to, went, to, went there to bring a feral cat that we just caught. So she has 60 cats and she's got, she takes very good care of them. They have a really, really nice place to live and they receive a lot of love and help. But this woman, no, every single cat has a name and she knows the name of every single cat. <laughs> and she also knows where they came from and what kind of personality they have. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's an example of somebody who can keep, you know, 60 cats in the mind at the same time. And other examples as well, like if you had a really extended family, some people have huge families with many siblings and aunts and uncles and then cousins and nephews and nieces. So you could easily have 60 people in your family. And it's possible, I mean, some people might have tr trouble keeping track of all those people, but some people might, you know, they might really be able to keep it, keep track of every single family member and, you know, who they are, what their name is and how they're doing and what they're doing and so on. So it is possible, you know, for even ordinary people like ourselves to be able to keep a lot of information in the mind at the same time. So again, here we're talking about a bodhisattva and, you know, they have incredible qualities of mind, single pointed concentration, calm abiding, and this huge amount of merit. They've been accumulating lots of merit and lots of wisdom for a long, long time, lifetimes, in fact, and incredible wisdom and incredible determination. They're so determined to do whatever it takes to reach enlightenment. So they're willing to put in the time and energy to cultivate this awareness, this knowledge of the 173 aspects. Also, um, remember, remember the goal of the path is to become a Buddha. And you know, one of the attributes of a Buddha is omniscience. <laughs> a Buddha has omniscient mind, which means that a Buddha's mind knows everything. The Buddha's mind sees all phenomena, all conventional ex truths, conventionally existing things, as well as all ultimate truths, all emptinesses. So, I mean, did you ever wonder how a Buddha's mind gets to that point? Mm -hmm. Did it just suddenly happen all at once when they become enlightened? Suddenly they know everything? <laughs> no. <laughs> so while they're on the path, a bodhisattva is um increasing their knowledge of different phenomena yeah they're expanding their awareness their knowledge of all kinds of different ph phenomena both both those things that are part of the path the things they know to to follow the path but also knowledge of of the faulty things you know the things that need to be overcome and eliminated because that's what they have to they have to help sending beings to be able to overcome all those things so bodhisattva is, is you know expanding their knowledge and their awareness of phenomena more and more and more and more and more and eventually they get to that point of enlightenment omniscience knowing everything okay so this um this peak application it starts on the pa uh, path of, of preparation, the beginning of the path of preparation, and it, it lasts the rest of the time on the bodhisattva's path, all the way up to the last moment of being a bodhisattva, just before enlightenment. So it exists all along there. And um, it has eight topics. So I'll just go through explaining all eight of them in a brief way, and then focus on a few of them. 
So the first four of the eight topics are on the path of preparation. If you remember the path of preparation. So again, that's the second path, second of the five paths. And um, it starts from when you have the union of calm abiding and special insight, observing emptiness, realizing emptiness. And it has four stages called heat, peak, uh, forbearance, and supreme ending quality. So as a bodhisattva is progressing through those four levels or four stages of the path of preparation, their realization of emptiness is increasing, getting stronger. They're working towards having a direct non-conceptual realization of emptiness, which happens with the path of seeing. Um, they're also accumulating a lot of merit to be able to you know, make their wisdom of emptiness more and more powerful so that they can graduate, <laughs> reach the path of seeing. So anyway, there's um, a peak application for each of the four uh, levels of the path of preparation. So number one, the peak application of heat, meaning heat means the heat level of the path of preparation. The reason it's called heat is because you're starting to get warm. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? The, the direct realization of emptiness that you have when you reach the path of seeing, which you know constitutes the path of seeing, that's like a fire that burns up. That's when you start eliminating um, obs obscurations, the things that need to be eliminated in the mind. And so it's a very powerful wisdom that's the path of seeing. So with the beginning of the path of pre preparation, it's as though you're starting to get warm. You're starting to get, that heat is starting to build up. Not literally. We shouldn't think of that as physical heat, but more like you're getting closer to the fire of wisdom, directly realizing emptiness. So under the peak application of heat, the first one, um, there are 12 signs that indicate that a bodhisattva has attained this level. Um, so just as an example, one of the signs is the bodhisattva views all phenomena as being like a dream, not only when they're awake, but also when they're asleep in the dream state. So they're able to see all phenomena as like dreams. And this is because they're very familiar with union of calm abiding and special insight observing emptiness. So while they're awake, especially in meditation, then they're strongly familiar with this union of calm abiding and special insight on emptiness. This enables them to see all phenomena as like dreams, um, even when they're actually dreaming. <laughs> <clears throat> so there's yeah, these 12 different signs. I won't go through all of them. The second one is peak application of peak. So this is this um, peak, the peak, um, <laughs> um, the peak stage, peak level of the path of preparation, second stage. And uh, under this topic, it said that the here the bodhisattva has an increase in merit. Their merit becomes much more powerful, increased. And there's 16 different ways in which the bodhisattva's merit has increased. So just to give an example, the first of these is that the bodhisattva is able to create much more merit than the merit of if all sentient beings of the billion fold world system were to make offerings to the Buddhas, offering flowers and so forth. So that's a huge number of sentient beings. Like you can just think all the sentient beings in the universe, if all of them were to make offerings to the Buddha, that would be a lot of merit, each being creating a huge amount of merit. But the merit of a Bodhisattva attaining this uh, level this stage is greater than that, is exceeding that amount of merit. 
So you probably heard these kind of expressions before of how doing this is so much more merit than some other huge <laughs> But anyway, the point is um, the Bodhisattva is able to create a huge amount of merit by attaining this stage. And then the next one, number three, is called peak application of the forbearance. So forbearance is the third stage, third level of the path of uh, preparation. And because on the previous level, peak level, they were able to create this huge amount of merit, then now on this next level, the forbearance level, the bodhisattva attains stable wisdom and stable method. And stable wisdom means they are able to attain a complete similitude of the three exalted knowers. Um, so I don't know exactly what that means, but anyway, <laughs> it wasn't an explanation of that. But the three exalted knowers are the, the three realizations in the explained in the first three paths. So at this point, um, a bodhisattva isn't able to have exactly those realizations in their mind because those realizations are only in the mind of Aryas, uh, those who've gained direct realization of emptiness. So bodhisattva is not at that point yet, but they are able to attain a similitude, something similar, something close, but not quite the exact thing. So that's the meaning of stable wisdom. And they also have stable method at this point, and that means they will not forsake the welfare of sentient beings. They will never give up on sentient beings. <clears throat> so their, their wisdom and their compassion at this point become very, very strong and also assist each other, help each other to increase. Then number four, peak application of supreme mundane quality. So supreme mundane quality is the name of the fourth and last level of the path of preparation. So here you're getting very close to the path of seeing so your wisdom of emptiness has become very, very strong. And um, so with this um, topic, uh, in this last stage, a bodhisattva has attained a thorough stability of mind with respect to limitless meditative stabilizations. So there's all different kinds of meditative practices that a bodhisattva engages in to be able to develop what they call mental dexterity. <laughs> um, so in addition to developing wisdom and concentration and so on, a bodhisattva also needs to develop the ability to do many other things with their mind and have a very dexterous mind. It makes me think of a gymnast, <laughs> mental, mental gymnastics. Um, we'll look at a, another example of this a little later. Um, but yeah, at this point, it says limitless. A bodhisattva has a stable mind regarding limitless meditative stabilizations. And these enable um, the bodhisattva to generate the, the next path, the path of seeing. So that's the next one, number five, peak application of the path of seeing. So the path of seeing, this is a very, very important stage of the Bodhisattva's path because this is where they have the direct non-conceptual realization of emptiness. And that mind, that realization is very, very powerful. It is, oh, we haven't finished yet. Could we go back? <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a very powerful mind that is able to eliminate, to get rid of uh, some of the obscurations, some of the 
faulty aspects of the mind that need to be eliminated for the mind to reach enlightenment. And specifically, the path of seeing um, eliminates the acquired obscurations, um, the afflictive obscurations and the knowledge obscurations. Although it's mainly what the Bodhisattva is mainly concerned about is overcoming the knowledge obscurations or the cognitive obscurations. And um, <clears throat> these are the conceptions of true existence, conceptions grasping at true existence. So this topic number five is very, very extensive. So I'll spend some more time, we'll spend some time looking at it um, on the next slide, but just to carry on. Number six is peak application of the path of meditation. So the path of meditation follows the path of seeing. And it's called the path of meditation because here the bodhisattva is continuing to meditate, to familiarize themselves with their direct realization of emptiness. And on the path of meditation, they gradually eliminate the um, innate levels of obscurations, the afflictive obscurations and the knowledge obscurations. So they do that in a number of levels um, stages. Um, and also, in we, we, don't, we don't have time to go into it, but under this topic, number six, um, there's explanation of special kinds of meditative stabilizations that a bodhisattva develops. Well, one kind is called leaping absorptions. <laughs> Do you remember there was the four the four concentrations and the four formless absorptions. So Bodhisattva develops all eight of those. And then they develop the ability to kind of leap over, you know, jump from, normally you have to just go one by one through them, but they can leap over them, going up, going down. <laughs> and there's also this one that's called the loftily looking lion. We had a lot of fun with that loftily looking line. We never got a clear idea why it's called that, but that's what it's called. So this is a really special kind of meditative practice where they're kind of, again, mental gymnastics, going through these different meditative absorptions up and down. And they don't do this just for fun, but it, because when they, when a bodhisattva they develop the, the four concentrations and the four formless absorptions, but they use them to focus on emptiness. So they use all these eight different absorptions with emptiness as the object. So they're always, you know, focused on emptiness, but they still develop this ability to go up and down and leaping this way and that way. And that it's said to be a way of increasing, enhancing their, their wisdom, their ability to focus on emptiness. So we don't have time to go into that, but I'm just mentioning it. So you know <laughs> this exists and this is something bodhisattvas do. Um, then number seven is the uninterrupted peak application. And this is, this is a peak application that occurs right at the last moment of being a bodhisattva, the last moment of the path of meditation, just before becoming a Buddha. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that one later. Um, and then number eight is called perverse achieving that is to be eliminated, indicated here. This consists of wrong conceptions, different kinds of wrong conceptions that hinder the bodhisattva to attain number seven, the in uninterrupted peak application, because they have to attain that one before they become a Buddha. That's like the last step before you become a Buddha. And um, it's the cause um, of becoming a Buddha in the next moment. And so before being able to attain the uninterrupted peak application, one has to eliminate certain wrong conceptions. And these wrong conceptions are specifically about the two truths, thinking that the two truths are, are contradictory, that there's some kind of contradiction between the two truths. So, so anyway, we'll, we'll look at it 
a few of those later. So that's just a brief overview of the eight topics. And now we'll look at a few of them in a bit more detail. So number five, so the next slide. So number five is called the peak application of the path of seeing. So as we were just saying, the path of seeing is the point when the bodhisattva attains the direct non-conceptual realization of emptiness, emptiness of true existence. And um, this is important because with that realization, they are able to eliminate or abandon a certain portion of obscurations. Um, there's two main kinds of obscurations that have to be eliminated. One is called afflictive obscurations. The other is knowledge obscurations, also known as obscurations to omniscience or cognitive obscurations. So do you remember what's included in afflictive obscurations according to this school? Anyone remember? Afflictions and mercy? Yeah, afflictions. <laughs> um, but the main one, the main affliction is um, the grasping at a self sufficient, substantially existent self. It's a kind of ignorance, ignorance believing in a self-sufficient, substantially existent self. So that's the sense of a self. The idea of a self as being a kind of boss or controller, someone in charge inside of us. So we all have that conception. We all have that innate uh, belief or grasping at that kind of a self. And um, that's the main afflictive obscuration. And obs afflictive obscurations in general are those that prevent the attainment of nirvana or liberation. They keep us in samsara. They keep us from attaining nirvana, liberation from samsara. So that's the main one. Plus other afflictions like anger, attachment, jealousy, pride. So all the other afflict afflictive emotions and, um, and their seeds, the seeds of those so those are afflictive obscurations, things that prevent nirvana, liberation. Um, and then there's two levels of obscurations, the acquired and the innate. So the innate are those that have been in our mind from beginningless time, even babies and animals have them. <laughs> and the acquired are those that come because of education like they, they usually say learning tenets so if you if you study a philosophical system that teaches you that you have a substantially existent self or that things are truly existent then you have on top of the innate afflictions or the innate obscurations you have additional ones from learning things that you've learned from others so when we attain the path of seeing all the acquired afflictive obscurations, those that have been acquired from learning, they are abandoned all at once. And likewise, the knowledge obscurations, the acquired knowledge obscurations, those are also abandoned all at once. Now, knowledge obscurations, what are those according to this school? Conception, yeah. So the knowledge obscurations, according to this school, it's different than Prasangika. According to this school, it's the conception of true existence and seeds and latencies of those. So again, those have two levels, acquired and innate. So the acquired are all abandoned here at this point. And so in the ornament, they explain um, so knowledge obscurations, again, these are conceptions of true existence. And in the ornament, it explains 36 
different conceptions of true existence, although I don't think that's exhaustive, but it's just, <laughs> I don't know why, but they say there are these 36 conceptions of true existence that are knowledge obscuration and that are abandoned. Um, and so I thought to just talk a little bit about these, give a few examples. So these 36 conceptions of true existence are in four groups of nine. Um, so I'll just briefly mention them here. And then the next slide, we have a, a chart and, and some examples of them. So the first group, um, uh, nine conceptions of apprehended objects to be engaged in. So when it says apprehended objects, what that means is these are objects of our mind, objects that we know or perceive or are aware of. And with this first group, they are objects to be engaged in for bodhisattva. So an example is Mahayana paths. Mahayana paths are something that bodhisattva wants to engage in. And they are objects. They are things the bodhisattva learns about, meditates on, gains a realization of. Um, but while they are engaging in those objects, they might conceive of them as truly existent, truly existent paths to be engaged in. And so that's a wrong conception. That's a conception that needs to be abandoned. So while they're engaging in the bodhis in the Mahayana paths, they have to make sure they don't conceive of those paths as um, truly existent paths to practice, to be engaged in. Then the second group are nine conceptions of apprehended objects to be turned away from. So again, these are objects that a bodhisattva would be aware of and know about, but they are things to be avoided, things to be, to turn away from. So an example is paths of hearers, hearers paths. So hearers are those who wish to attain personal liberation, uh, solitary peace, it's sometimes called just freeing themselves from samsara, attaining nirvana liberation just for themselves, which is fine, but that's not what bodhisattvas want to do. So <laughs> bodhisattva wants to avoid that kind of path um, because it's an obstacle for their goal of attaining Buddhahood and helping all living beings. So when a bodhisattva is looking at, thinking about considering the paths of hearers um, and knowing that's not what I want to do, that's not where I want to go, they have to make sure they don't see those as truly existent paths to be uh, turned away from. So all of these are conceptions of true existence. They're just dealing with different objects, different objects and seeing those objects as truly existent. And this is something a bodhisattva needs to abandon to get rid of. The next group, nine conceptions of apprehender subjects of substantial existence. This is complicated, <laughs> very complicated. I'll try to explain it. So an apprehender is a mind, is something that apprehends. And so it's always a mind, a consciousness and awareness, a subject that knows objects. And so these are nine conceptions that observe a mind, a certain type of mind. And in this case, this first group, these are minds of substantial existence. So an example would be um, a mind that conceives of a substantially existent person, thinking that there's a, a person who's substantially existent. And, and so if a bodhisattva was looking at that mind that's thinking of substantial existence and thinking that mind is truly existent, then this is wrong. This is a mistake, something to be abandoned. We'll, we'll spend more time on that in the next slide. I'll, I'll go through that 
uh, more carefully, but just to give a general idea here. Then the last group, nine conceptions of apprehenders, subjects of imputed existence. And so uh, an example would be an Arya. So an Arya is again, a person who's gained the direct realization of emptiness. An Arya no longer thinks of beings as self-supporting, substantially existent persons because they realize, though, that kind of person doesn't exist. They understand persons as imputedly existent. Okay, so in the mind of an Arya, there would be this mind, this realization, this awareness, knowing that persons are imputedly existent. So then that mind, looking at that mind that sees imputed existence, if you were to think of that as truly existent, that's a truly existent mind that understands imputed existence, that's wrong. That's a mistake. That's something a bodhisattva has to abandon. They're complicated. Um, and I don't, I'm not quite sure why they <laughs> come up with all these complications, but anyway, this is what's in the text. So I'm just giving you some idea. So, so those are the 36, four groups of nine. Then there's a set of these 36 for each of the three realms, the desire realm, where we are, the form realm, where the four dhyanas are, and the formless realm, four formless realms. And so 36 times three makes 108. Normally an auspicious number, but these are 108 things that we have to abandon. We want to get rid of a bodhisattva wants to get rid of. They are knowledge obscurations. That's K-O. Didn't have room. Yeah, there's <laughs> not enough room to write them all out. So a bodhisattva, when, it, when a bodhisattva reaches the path of seeing, in that very first moment of the path of seeing, they gain that direct realization of emptiness. So that eliminates all the acquired levels of these knowledge obscurations, as well as the afflictive obscurations, all in one go, one moment. And I came across something in my notes about acquired. Um, so again, acquired means learned from others by studying incorrect philosophy, incorrect tenets. Um, and we might wonder about people who haven't studied those kind of philosophies as well as babies and animals. <laughs> um, so in such people, they probably don't have a manifest form of these um, these acquired obscurations. However, in previous lives, like in our past lives, we, we were exposed to incorrect tenets. We all were. We all learned, you know, wrong ways of thinking. And, and there are seeds in our mind of those um, mistaken teachings that we received. And so even if we don't have on the manifest level, these sort of um, wrong ways of thinking, we do have the seeds of them. And so those are also included in the acquired um, obscurations. Because if we have those seeds in our mind, then if we do have the right conditions, if we do happen to go to a certain teacher or a certain place and they're teaching us things that you know in, increase our wrong ways of thinking about true existence and self-sufficient substantial existence and so on then those things can manifest again so does that make sense that everyone at least has the seeds of these and those are included also in the acquired um, levels of afflictive and knowledge obscuration. So all of those, but yeah, they all get 
cleared away, eliminated as soon as we attain the path of seeing. That's good news. So are there acquired and innate versions of your Alhamdulillah? Yeah. <clears throat> That's my understanding. So, yeah, I was trying to explain a bit. So I made a chart on the next page with next um, slide with, with examples, just in case you're curious. So again, these are 36 conceptions of true existence in four different groups. So on the left, um, the two boxes are conceptions of apprehended objects. And so the first group are apprehended to be engaged in. And the example is a conception that adheres to the Mahayana paths and results as truly existent objects of utilization. So what that means is if you're, if you're a bodhisattva, you want to follow the Mahayana paths and results. You want to practice those. You see those as things to utilize, things to use, things to engage in. But if you have the conception of those paths and results as truly existent, which is possible since you know we do see everything as truly existent, then that is something you have to abandon. So while you're engaging in Bodhisattva's Mahayana paths and results, you have to you know, remember, <laughs> realize that they are empty of true existence. So that's one kind of conception of true existence that needs to be abandoned. And below that is an example of um, an apprehended object to be turned away from. So example is a conception that adheres to the true paths of hearers and solitary realizers as truly existent objects of utilization. So um, a bodhisattva knows about the hearer's paths and the solitary realizer's paths. And, and for hearers and solitary realizers, those paths are valid. Those are, those are the paths that they want to follow. But from the point of view of a bodhisattva, those are to be avoided. I don't want to follow those paths because they lead to solitary peace. And that's not where I want to go. I want to go to enlightenment. And they're actually obstacles. <laughs> if you get stuck in solitary peace, then you take much longer to get enlightened. So they definitely want to avoid those. But still, while looking at those paths, if they see them as truly existent, that would be wrong. So they have to realize that those paths of hearers and solitary realizers are empty of true existence. Then on the right side, the apprehenders, <laughs> compli more complicated ones. <laughs> so the first are apprehended subjects of substantial existence. So example, the conception that through observing an ordinary being's apprehender, that apprehends a person as substantially existent, adheres to it as a truly existent utilizer. <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's say there's a bodhisattva, bodhisattva named Mary. And bodhisattva, see, bodhisattvas develop the ability to see the minds of others. They develop that clairvoyance that can see other beings' minds and what's going on in other beings' minds. So let's say Mary the Bodhisattva is looking at Joe, who's just an ordinary being, and he and she can see in Joe's mind there's um, there's this uh, conception of being a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, which you know all sentient beings have. That's an innate conception everyone has. So Mary's looking at Joe's mind and seeing, oh, Joe thinks he's substantially existent, and. <laughs> And if Mary thinks that that mind of Joe's is truly existent, that's a truly existent mind, then that's a misconception. Yeah, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, but I guess it, the point is that, yeah, 
a conception of true existence can arise with regard to anything, any different kind of object, not just tables and chairs and dogs and cats, but even somebody else's mind and whether that mind is a correct mind or a faulty mind, a wrong mind, or correct, you know, still you have to be careful not to see any of those objects as truly existent. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So with the idea that then these sets go into the three realms, yeah. is it that Mary then is associated with each of the three realms or that Joe could be a being on each of the three realms? Now that is something I don't know. And I don't think we ever got, in, got teachings on how these are actually related okay. to the three realms. I have that question myself. So I'll try to find an answer to that. Yeah, how, yeah, that's too detailed for me right now. <laughs> okay, so then the last group, these are conceptions of apprehender subjects of imputed existence. So an example is a conception that through observing an Arya being's apprehender that apprehends a being as imputedly existent adheres to it as a truly existent utilizer. So again, let's say Mary the Bodhisattva, this time she's looking at uh, an Arya named Michael. So Michael the Arya, and in Michael's mind, he has this realization of uh, beings, maybe himself or others or whatever, as just imputedly existing. Because, you know, as an aria, he's already realized that nobody is substantially existent. Persons, beings are not substantially existent. So he's free of that misconception. So he knows that beings, persons are just imputedly existent. So he's got that realization in his mind. So Mary is looking at that, that mind in, in Michael's mind. And if she were to think of that mind as being truly existent, then that's wrong conception. I suppose it's not really clear when, you know, when it talks about these minds that are being apprehended, if it's other beings' minds or one's own, it's also possible they could be your own mind. That isn't something we got into. So my guess is it could be either seeing these minds in yourself and mistakenly thinking they are truly existent and having to overcome that misconception or seeing those minds in someone else and the need to see them as empty of inherent existence. Yeah, so they're complicated, but <laughs> I just thought to share. Um, and like I say, Perhaps the reason for getting into such complicated examples of conceptions of true existence is just to show that, yeah, true existence, conception of true existence in our mind can arise with regard to any kind of object, even things that are very subtle and not just things that are very gross. And so all conceptions of true existence have to be eliminated, have to be abandoned. If we conceive of even an atom, one tiny atom as truly existent, then that becomes an obstacle to attaining enlightenment. So all conceptions of true existence have to be overcome, have to be eliminated. I think that's the point. Yeah, so under this topic, then it goes through... <laughs> I just gave a few examples, but it goes through 36 different conceptions. And also um, after that, it also, uh, there's also an explanation of the 12 links of dependent origination. And um, this is, it said that this is something that a bodhisattva will meditate on during subsequent attainment, meaning the time, break times. So some time, some of their time they spend in meditation, 
focused on emptiness, developing their familiarity with emptiness. And then when they're not meditating on emptiness during their break times in between sessions, um, they meditate on other things such as the 12 links. So Bodhisattva needs to meditate on those as well. And it also mentions like the different ways of meditating on the 12 links, the forward way, going from one up to 12, also the reverse way from 12 back to one, like we were doing recently, Venerable Children. And then, and then each of those ways also has two ways. One is the afflicted way, like how ignorance gives rise to karmic formations and so on and so forth and keeps us in samsara. And then the pure way, how by eliminating ignorance, then we eliminate karmic formations and so on and so forth, how we get out of samsara. So a bodhisattva will meditate on all these different ways, forward, reverse, afflicted, pure. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, this section, this particular topic of the peak application of the path of seeing is very long and very lots of information in it. Um, okay, so then let's look at one of the other topics. Um, this is number eight. And wait a minute, did I make a mistake? Look, there were only eight altogether. Well, this is seven. <laughs> I misnumbered it. Yeah, there's, this is seven. And then there's one more after this. I made a mistake. So this is actually number seven. Uninterrupted peak application. Um, so this is the last uninterrupted path at the end of the continuum of a sentient being and is the final direct cause of Buddhahood. So the term uninterrupted path, we did look at that earlier, some time ago, mainly when we were talking about the path of seeing, one of the first classes. So the term uninterrupted path, um, it always refers to um, direct, realization of emptiness so it's when a mind is you know single-pointedly focused on emptiness seeing emptiness directly non-conceptually and and it's an, the meaning of uninterrupted path is that particular mind realizing emptiness has the ability has the power to eliminate a portion of our um, obscurations, the things that we need to abandon. So the first moment of the path of seeing is an uninterrupted path. And it's said to last just a moment, but that uninterrupted path, of course, you've been building up to it for a long, long, long time with all your practice on meditating on emptiness and accumulating merit and so on and so forth. But that one moment of directly realizing emptiness at the beginning of the path of seeing has the power to eliminate all the acquired obscurations, both the afflictive and the knowledge obscurations. Um, but that's just the first under, uninterrupted path as you're on your way to enlightenment. And then later, when you're on the path of meditation, there's actually uh, 10 uninterrupted paths that occur periodically and those eliminate gradually the um, innate obscurations the innate uh, afflictive obscurations and the innate knowledge obscurations so it's kind of like they're shaving off the different levels different layers of obscurations preventing your attainment of enlightenment and so Right at the end of everything, uh, being a bodhisattva, the end of the path of, of meditation, right before becoming a Buddha, that 
last moment is called the end of the continuum of a sentient being <laughs> because the next moment you're not going to be a sentient being anymore you're going to be a buddha um, and so that very last moment is an uninterrupted path and this that this that particular uninterrupted path eliminates the last bit of obscurations knowledge obscurations effective obscurations it's the last things that need to be cleared away to become a buddha and so this um yeah that's what's meant by this uninterrupted peak application um and the reason it's called uninterrupted is because um it's free from even the slightest obstacle and it will definitely lead to buddhahood in the next moment and and so this this well any uninterrupted path is a cause for the next moment of mind which is called a liberated path and the liberated path is a state of mind in which your mind is free of whatever obstacles have just been eliminated in this case the next moment would be buddhahood um and so it's like a cause an uninterrupted path is like a cause for the liberated path that follows it they have a cause and effect relationship and in the case of ordinary causes um sometimes even though something has the potential to bring about a result it's possible that things could interrupt that and it wouldn't be able to bring its result. For example, a seed, you know, a tomato seed or a barley seed or whatever, it has the ability to produce a sprout and then a plant and then whatever, flowers, vegetables, and so on. The potential is there, but something could happen to that seed. It might get burned or crushed or whatever and then it would not be able to bring about its result so that's something that can happen with causes even though they have the ability to bring the result something could interrupt and they wouldn't be able to bring the result but in this case an uninterrupted path is such that nothing will stop it <laughs> it's unstoppable <laughs> nothing will interrupt it it will definitely give rise to its result so in this case the result is buddhahood um, omniscient mind so that's why it's called uninterrupted the term uninterrupted and nothing can stop it nothing can interfere with it bringing its result and it said that the third bullet point um, its merit is immense greater than the merit of setting all sentient beings in the paths <laughs> so having attained this uninterrupted path this last uninterrupted path before buddhahood um, the merit of this attainment is, is said to be vast immense more than if you were to set all sentient beings in one of the paths so if you could actually do something to bring all sentient beings into the path and it, so that they attain at least one of the paths path of accumulation or whatever that would be marvelous that would be incredible that would be greatly meritorious but attaining this is said to be even more meritorious than that because in the next moment you're going to be a buddha and a new Buddha has just arisen or just come into existence. And then that Buddha will be able to benefit all sinning beings for all of time. So even to attain the cause of Buddhahood, this uninterrupted cause of Buddhahood is incredible. Then the last point says this, um, the observed objects, are all illusory phenomena and the appearing object is their emptiness of true existence so i can't remember whether i mentioned this before but uh, it did come up earlier in the text i think in chapter one um there was this whole debate discussion about um an aria's direct realization of emptiness okay so 
you know, anytime a person is in meditative equipoise, directly focused on emptiness, directly realizing emptiness. So that mind, um, it said that, so, so the only thing that appears to that mind is emptiness. Nothing else appears. So all the conventional phenomena, conventional things, all of those do not appear. However, it is said that the observed objects of that mind are all phenomena, all whatever exists. And this is a very strange thing to say <laughs> because when it says observed object, it sounds like they're observed, they're seen, they appear, but apparently not. Um, don't ask me why, but this is what came up in the text earlier. Um, <clears throat> so the conclusion of that discussion and that debate was that uh, the observed objects of a mind don't have to appear. They don't actually have to appear. They can still be observed, but yeah, we don't have to, we shouldn't take observed literally here, the term observed literally. It's just a technical term. Um, the observed objects or the objects of observation are objects that are being referred to or related to. But in this case, the Arya's wisdom directly realizing emptiness, um, it does in a way refer to those objects, but it's realizing the emptiness of inherent existence of those objects. It's realizing the, um, the true nature, the final nature the final mode of existence of all phenomena. So that's something unique uh, to the direct realization of emptiness um, with a not conceptual realization of emptiness, inferential realization of emptiness, you can only realize the emptiness of one thing at a time. But when it comes to the direct realization of emptiness, it's said that yeah, when you when you directly realize emptiness, you are directly realizing the emptiness of all phenomena, whatever exists. However, all those phenomena don't actually appear. <laughs> Only their emptiness appears. I mean, that's just what they say. I have no experience of this at all, so I can't speak from experience. But anyway, the point is, all phenomena are the observed objects but the appearing objects is only their emptiness. And the reason giving, given for why all phenomena are the observed objects is because all phenomena are the bases for eliminating superimpositions. So when an aria is directly realizing emptiness, they are eliminating superimpositions, wrong ways of thinking, wrong ways of seeing things with respect to all phenomena. That realization of emptiness is so powerful. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but this is what it's mentioned, it's said in the text. And it's interesting to know, and some of you may have heard it before, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Okay, so let's look at the next one, which is number eight, not nine. I made a mistake. So this is the last of the topics in chapter five, and it's called perverse achievings. And the term achieving, we came across this term before in chapter one, and there it meant a practice, a bodhisattva's practice. But here, our teacher said it means a conception. So perverse achieving means a perverse conception, a wrong conception. And so these are wrong conceptions related to the compatibility of the two truths. They occur due to not understanding that phenomena exist conventionally, but are empty of true existence. So earlier in the first or second class, I can't remember what it was, we did spend some time looking at the two truths, how they're explained in this um, school, Svatantrika. And it was said that 
the two truths, and this is true for Prasangika as well, the two truths are said to be one entity, but different. One entity means that, you know, if, if two things are one entity, it means they arise together and they abide together, they exist together, and then they cease together. So their existence is like simultaneous. And um, so, um, yeah, I mean, a common example of, 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 of two things that are one entity would be our body and its parts. <laughs> so our body and the parts of our body come into existence at the same time. It's not that our body comes in to existence at one point in time and then the parts come into existence later, but they come into existence together and they abide together, the body and the parts abide together, and then they cease together. When we die, our body dies, the parts, I mean, the parts are still there, but we would no longer say they're parts of a body in the sense of a living body, it's a dead body. Maybe that's not a very good example. <laughs> Um, yeah, but anyway, that they do usually say that an object, even like a table, and its parts are one entity. They abide, they arise and abide and cease together. That's the meaning of one entity. So this applies to the true truths. If we take an example of um, a conventional truth, like a computer, so that's a conventional truth. And then the ultimate truth is the emptiness of the computer, emptiness of true existence it means it doesn't exist truly. So the conventional truth, the computer, and the ultimate truth, its emptiness, those two things abide together, they arise together, they exist together, they cease together. When the computer came into existence, when it was produced in the factory, its emptiness came into existence at the same time. And as long as the computer is there, functioning as a computer, then its emptiness is there. And then if the computer gets destroyed, smashed, or taken apart, sold for parts or whatever, it's no longer a computer, its emptiness will also go out of existence. So that's, that's the case with any conventional phenomena, any conventional truth. It and its emptiness, its ultimate truth, are one nature. But in, in spite of being one nature, they are different. Sometimes they use the expression different isolates. What that means is um, they can't be separated physically, but they can be separated conceptually. We can think about them differently. They are two different things. They're not the same thing. They're two different things that can be understood, thought about separately. So this is an important point because it comes up a lot in the philosophical teachings when they say, there's lots of examples of this, two things that are one entity, meaning they can't really be separated physically, and yet they are different meaning they're not one and the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing. They are two different things and they can be conceptually understood differently. So this is the case with the two truths, um, conventional truths and ultimate truths. They are um, one entity and um, different, different isolates, and they are completely compatible not contradictory. They don't contradict each other. Now, in the process of learning about ultimate truth, meditating on ultimate truth, it's possible, in fact, it seems quite normal, to have difficulty with this. Difficulty being able to see the compatibility of the two truths, the non-contradictory nature of the two truths. In fact, right up to the last moment before enlightenment, you're still having difficulty with that. There's still 
<clears throat> conceptions in the mind that um, have difficulty seeing the two truths as, as compatible. So anyway, that's what this one is all about. These are wrong conceptions that, um, yeah, aren't able to understand the two truths as being compatible and non-contradictory. And they have to be eliminated in order to attain uninterrupted peak application. The, um, this point number, yeah, this last moment of, of the path right before enlightenment. So there are 16 of these, the last bullet point, 16 of these wrong conceptions. So one example, um, one example is thinking that all phenomena can't be the observed objects of the uninterrupted peak application and EKA, I, that means exalted, oh, it should be EKA, exalted knower of all aspects. In other words, omniscient mind, um, because they are empty of true existence. So as I was just saying, um, we were just looking at this uninterrupted peak application, the last moment before enlightenment, all phenomena are the objects of observation of that. The objects, objects of observation are all phenomena. And the same is true with Buddha's mind. Um, for Buddha's mind, omniscient mind, all phenomena are objects of observation of Buddha's mind. So somebody might think, oh, that's not possible because they are empty of true existence. So this would happen because, for example, the lower schools, the non-Madhyamika schools, Buddha schools, um, believe that things have to have true existence. Things must exist truly, otherwise they wouldn't exist at all. If things were empty of true existence, they wouldn't exist. And then the Buddha, Buddha wouldn't be able to see them. <laughs> Buddha wouldn't be able to know those phenomena. So does that make sense? So this is an example of um, a mind that sees the two truths as contradictory. And, and that is an obstacle. That kind of conception is an obstacle to being able to attain Buddhahood and the last moment of mind just before Buddhahood. Yeah, so Madhyamaka school, both Svatantrika and Prasangika, put a lot of emphasis on the importance of seeing the two truths as um, complementary, con non contradictory, and um, like two sides of a coin. That's a simple way of saying it. You know, they're like two sides of a coin. You can't really separate them. Both exist together in on one object. Yeah, every single phenomenon has both truths as complementary, non-contradictory, and even depending on each other, relying on each other. So that's a very important thing to understand and overcome any conceptions to the contrary. So I've actually, <clears throat> we have just 10 minutes left. Um, we're finished with chapter five. And, and then the next two chapters are actually both very short. Chapter six consists of one verse. <laughs> and then chapter seven has five verses. Um, so I sort of prepared, I was planning to talk about both of these today, but I think we've run out of time. So we'll have to leave it for next time. So we have two classes left and um, I wanted to save more time for chapter eight because chapter eight is about um, enlightenment, about uh, Buddhahood. So um, goes through the four Buddha bodies, the four kayas of a Buddha. I mean, there's a huge amount of material. We won't have time to go through all of it, but just to share some of it. It's very beautiful, very inspiring. So, yeah, so next time I'll kind of quickly go through 
chapter six and seven and then start on chapter eight. Any questions anybody has? Maybe an irrelevant question or one that the Moshe Mitz did ask a Buddha, but anyway. Um, <laughs> they talk about how once you realize emptiness, or I think it's good, once you realize emptiness, you can start emanating different bodies. Um, that's where you start working through like different activities. Um, I don't know whether this text ever describes how that works or is it just it sparked in my mind when you were talking about how in subsequent attainment on the path of sin where you start as a meditator in the 12 weeks and then the question still arose I think about how does this what this emanation of body that are going out and doing things work in terms of what the body stuff is doing like is either in emptiness meditating on emptiness and like you know, the link and how does this <clears throat> so the ability to emanate bodies um, starts with a path of seeing, mm -hmm. not before that. So it's the direct realization of emptiness. Mm -hmm. um, from that point, yeah, so from the path of seeing the first ground, um, Bodhisattva is able to emanate a hundred different forms. And then with the second ground, a thousand and so on. So with each ground, you can emanate more and more bodies, more and more forms. Um, I can't remember if we got into details about how a bodhisattva actually does that. <laughs> um, but I think in in um, I think it has to do with this mental body. Um, we looked at a few weeks ago how when a bodhisattva um, attains the path of seeing, there, what used to be a physical body um, that was the result of, of karma and afflictions, normal body like we have, that this actually transforms into a mental body, body of the nature of mind. And um, that's something quite mysterious. <laughs> I don't fully understand how that works, but it's because of their great compassion and their wisdom and all the other amazing qualities. So I think the emanations have to do with this mental body. Yeah, but, um, but I don't remember we learned details about how they actually do it. <laughs> and maybe it's not even in the texts. I don't know, maybe it's just something the Bodhisattva just spontaneously, instinctively knows once they reach that level. Um, yeah, I, I know there were a lot of students were asking questions about it, <laughs> something very, um, very interesting. So I can't really say more about that. But also, um, you, you can also do this kind of thing even before the path of seeing, because um, there's these six clairvoyances or six super knowledges and one of those is called magical emanation or something and so that also enables you to create manifestations of yourself emanate create emanations and that can be attained just on the basis of um well calm abiding and then after calm abiding attaining the first jhana and then doing the special practices to be able to gain that ability. Um, so you can be an ordinary being. You don't even have to be somebody on the Buddhist path. Yeah, an ordinary being can develop that kind of ability. Um, so it's not, yeah, it's not something exclusive to Buddhism, exclusive to the Bodhisattva path. But I don't think with that, kind of like in the six clairvoyances, I don't think you're able to emanate so many, mm -hmm. maybe one at a time or two at a time, but not like a hundred or a thousand as the Bodhisattva is able to do. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but. 
Yeah. But yeah, I mean, for Bodhisattva, the whole purpose of doing this is to be able to help more beings because you can send an emanation here and there in the hell realms and the animal realms and all these different um, places and be able to help many, many, many beings at the same time. Um, I'll see if I can find some more, dig out some more information about that. But just from what I can recall, there, it wasn't really, yeah, we didn't go into detail with that. Anyone online have a question? No questions here, but I do have a host question after these type of questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, Venerable Dondrup wanted me to ask or to, or to take a poll. We don't have a big gathering here in our Zoom group, but who was going to be taking the exam? And I wasn't even sure that there was going to be an exam, Venerable. Well, my understanding is this is a basic program subject, although I think it might be an optional one. I'm not sure, but normally somebody who wants to do the basic program and complete all the subjects and get a certificate, they have, there needs to be a test or an exam at the end of each course. And so I had asked Venerable Dundrup if anybody wants to do that, if anybody is doing this course with that in mind of, you know, getting the certificate. And in which case I would have to write an exam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what I, yeah, I just wanted to know that. So if any of the people from Tup to Norbo Ling um, wish to do that, please let me know. You don't have to decide tonight, but do let me know because I will have to, you know, create an exam. Stephen and I have been taking the exams. I'm not going for certification. I'm just, I just do the exams, have been for a couple of years. But I, I'll ask Stephen if his if his goal is for the certification and, and uh, let Venerable Dondrup know. Stephen okay. is still on vacation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Okay, so let's uh, complete or finish with um, dedication of merit. So feel confident that we have created a lot of merit spending this time together looking at these precious teachings on the bodhisattva's path and at least getting seeds on our mind imprints on our mind to be able to follow this path um, in the future and uh, so we definitely created a lot of merit of positive energy and now let's share that merit with all other beings wishing them all to um, again meet the path meet the dharma meet the meet the teachings and follow the path and reach enlightenment as quickly as possible. And we'll also dedicate to the long lives of our precious teachers. <clears throat> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen, arise, and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish-fulfilling, wish-granting jewel, <clears throat> source of every benefit and happiness in this world, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three sublime ones, the savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.